Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Wow, this is Thanksgiving week, as we said, and uh, it is certainly a time that we can give thanks to God. Do you know why? Because he is faithful. And he is good. And I have some good news for you. You know what that good news is? You want to know? The good news is that God loves us so much that he has been communicating with us ever since the fall. And he continues to be with us and he wants to always communicate with us. He always wants us to be in his presence. God is always and has and will always desire to be with his people. And that's why we can feel his presence here. And it's such a great thing. You know, in the Old Testament, right after Adam and Eve, it's, it began from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 22. You know, in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve kind of messed this whole thing up, to Revelation 22, where he's going to restore everything. He's been with us every step of the way. In the Old Testament, we look at what he did, even in the direct intervention of helping Adam and Eve to be recovered from what they did. He established a nation through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he wanted of his own. He was with his people at the Exodus when they came out of Egypt. And you understand the miracles that are in the Old Testament, the Red Sea, the Jordan River, miracles of provision that he gave to them. He got them to the promised land, a land that he wanted them to have to settle in. He fought their battles. He won their battles for them because they could not win themselves. He even had Moses construct a tabernacle and a temple so that he could be with them. And then came Jesus, the transition. And Jesus was a Passover lamb that takes away the sins of this world. His life, provision, and miracles spoke volumes while he was here. And when he said the three words that I think are one of the most powerful three words that he ever uttered, it is finished. And the curtain that was a barrier between us and direct access to God was torn in two. Do you realize the love God had through Jesus that he desired? Now we didn't have to sacrifice anymore. Now we have access directly to God himself. And then Jesus said something that was really great. He says, when I go, I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit to be your comforter, to teach you everything that I have told you. And you look at the early church and the formation of that and the miracles of the early church. I mean, even, the, even they couldn't even keep Peter in prison because God would kind of, you know, the angels had the keys to the jailhouse because God has keys to every place that we are locked up in. Amen? And so he was there even when they were trying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let him out. And so today, he works in the Holy Spirit. And that's what Pastor Ryan has been preaching in this series. And it is an honor for me to be able to continue on with this series of the Holy Spirit. Because to me, as I study this, it is a direct access of God through him to his church. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit now. In the next couple of weeks. And if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and this is where we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. In verse 1, and I apologize, there won't be any scriptures on the screen or whatever. This all kind of came after, but uh, we will have it in the after sermon notes, okay? But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. 
And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so if you can say today Jesus is Lord, you know the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And he has been our helper and it will continue to be our helper. In verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. So he gives us gifts, he gives us service, and he gives us working. And in verse 7, it says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And that is important because that means that everything the Holy Spirit does, it helps to build us up as believers, but it edifies us as a church for the common good. Verse 8, To no one, to one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Wow. God determines these gifts to lift us up. Spiritual gifts, the word spirit comes from the word in the Greek pneumatica, which means, which comes from pneuma, which is spirit. So we already know that, spiritual. But gifts, the interesting thing is that the Greek word for gifts is charos, which we get the word charismatic. Charis means grace. So when I looked up the word gifts, here's the definition. It is to show favor. A gift of grace, an undeserved benefit. So in essence, what is happening here is that God has given us the ability to show favor through what he wants to do through the church. This is ministries or abilities that the Holy Spirit gives to believers for the edification of the church. This is a dynamic move of God within the context of the church. It is his assistance and involvement in his people. And in Romans 1, Paul first mentioned this, this, uh, this ability of the gifts. He says, I, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So we know the gifts are here and designed to make us strong as a church. When we take a look at the various types of gifts in Scripture, we see various types that, that we're not going to talk about, but some of them are in Romans 12. We have motivational gifts. When you look at prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership or governing, and mercy. There are also ministry gifts in the latter half of 1 Corinthians 12, where it says apostles, prophets, teachers, workers of miracles, healing, helping others, administration, and tongues. Why? Why do we have the spiritual gifts? Well, in Ephesians 4, we have the answer. In verses 11 to 13, it says, It was he. It was who? God. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. To what? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we are all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The reason why he gives these gifts, the reason why he moves in our lives through the Holy Spirit is to build us up. It is to perfect us. It is to allow unity to happen. It is for the knowledge of Christ to be perfected in us so that we can be mature. So what did God give the spirits for? The gifts of the Spirit. He gave it so that we could 
be perfected and to grow and to be transformed. How many of you have ever heard of the fruit of the Spirit? See, the fruit of the Spirit is the same. It, it, it's something that, that is manifested to help us to grow in the Lord. And there are nine of them that are mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So Anthony De Palma was talking about the similarities and differences between gifts and fruit. And I find this to be very interesting. You see, the fruit and gifts, both of them have the source as the Holy Spirit, that part of what God wants to do to bring us transformation. They both do not originate with the believer apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't possess these unless you have the Holy Spirit in you. They both are supernatural. They don't come from inside of you. They're given to us by God. And the overarching purpose is to edify the church, to edify the body of Christ. But the neat thing about it is, is that they're both not received in their finished form. You are working into it. Some of us may need to learn how to love more. Some of us need to learn how to be patient more. Some of us need to learn how to be self-controlled more, right? So they're being perfected. Same thing with the gifts. But they need to be developed to edify the body, to, to bring the church together. Fruit is developed to mature the believer. So see how they kind of work together. It's like God has given us the tools. Are these tools in your toolbox? Are you able to grow individually so he can use you in the gifts of the Spirit? Because that's exactly what he needs for us to work together. You see, the need is to mature and develop and grow and transform into the image of Christ. God does not want us to stand still. He needs us to continue to move forward. And I said this at the 9 o'clock. If you are standing still, the enemy, is, it's easy for him to get you. So you have to be moving in maturity. You have to be moving in unity. You have to be moving in the fruit of the Spirit so that you can be used to help edify the church in the gifts of the Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verses 17 to 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces... We have unfailed face, faces. You know, Moses, when he, when he had an encounter with God, he was so radiant that he had to veil his face. But we, with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. You reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Wow. You reflect his glory. You see, I don't really care how much you don't believe that. Because inside of you, God exists, and he is there to reveal his glory through you. And he reveals it through the fruit of the Spirit, but he also reveals it through the gifts of the Spirit. It is God being able to be here with us. He is with you out there, and he is with us in here. And when we're together, we are the strongest that we can possibly be. And that's why we need to not forsake the assembly together of the saints. And all the more as you see the day approaching, you've got to have the tools to overcome the darkness. You've got to have the tools to overcome depression. You've got to have the tools to overcome anxiety. You've got to have the tools to overcome doubt and fear. And God has given it to us. He wants to edify the church. And so he's given us these gifts. But there are differences between the gifts and the fruit, too. You see, fruit inside is the result of the indwelling spirit. When the spirit works in you, the fruit grows. Do you know that the word fruit actually implies growth? It's like it has to grow in you. You have to perfect it. Lord, give me the fruit of self-control. <laughs> You know, sometimes he's going to give us a little bit of adversity to help us to grow in that fruit. Lord, help me to love a little bit more. Well, then he might bring an unlovable person to you. So you learn to live through God's love. Joy, 
peace, patience. It works inside of us. But gifts are the result of the empowering spirit, the empowering spirit that re it is resident in us. Fruit are ethical in nature. It helps us to behave better. But gifts are charismatic in nature. There is power and anointing in the gifts to be able to edify the church. All believers are required to demonstrate all the fruit of the Spirit. You have access to every single fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that? No excuses. I just don't have patience. I've heard people, I've said it, I just don't have patience for this. Well, get your toolbox out and access the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You know? We are to demonstrate all the fruit of the Spirit, but God does not require all believers to have all the gifts. Because the gifts are going to work separate because they come from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Fruit are required are acquired through receptivity and earnest desire, but gifts are the sovereign work of the Spirit. Believers are required to manifest spiritual fruit, but the manifestation of the spiritual gifts is at the bidding of the Holy Spirit. Did you, I mean, think of how God is with us today in the Holy Spirit here. He gives us fruit so we can work with him individually, but he gives us the gifts so he can empower the church to continue to be in unity and transformation. And he needs us to be there. So the whole bottom line is, is that faith builds up the individual believer, but gifts edify the church as a whole. George Wood, who is a general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, he was a national leader a few years back. He wrote this about the gifts. He made this, these statements. He says, gifts are given for the benefit of the body of Christ's work in the world. They are not given so that we can be stars. <laughs> I just love that. Folks, if you've been using the gift of the Holy Spirit, you are not a star. You're just being used of God. Gifts should not be confused with spirituality. Some people measure their spirituality on the basis of their gifts. <laughs> Listen, God used a donkey. He can use us, right? How many know what I'm talking about? It helps to have the fruit of the Spirit in you so God can use you in whatever gifts. But if God should use you in a gift, it doesn't mean you're a spiritual person. It just means God wanted to use you at that particular time. Now, we become spiritual, right? We become spiritual so he can use us more. That's the hope that we have in the church. George Wood said, we don't go wandering after people simply because they have gifts. <laughs> somebody comes up here and somebody lays hands on somebody and, and they get healed. So they have a gift of healing at that particular time. And now we're following them around. Where's Ryan? I need healing. You know? And there is power in that. And there, there are some people that actually do have that gifting. But how many of you know at any time, at any way, you could pray for somebody and they can be healed? So again, it is at the direction of the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in our lives. Gifts are often matched with natural inclination and abilities. So what I do in counseling requires a lot of wisdom and knowledge. And so he kind of matches that. And I see that being used in my ministry. Gifts are developmental in nature, which means we develop them. We don't rest on them. We allow them to develop. Gifts are not pri proprietary. I practiced that between the services. I had a problem with 9 o'clock. <laughs> Gifts are not proprietary. Pri pri <laughs> All right, Pastor. You know, it's like <laughs> pri pri um, proprietary. In other words, hey, one of my favorite restaurants is, uh, is uh, Ruby Tuesday. They're all going out. I don't know where, so what's happening there? Priority. And I love the blue cheese dressing at Ruby Tuesday. And I asked them one time, can we get that? Because that was my favorite blue cheese dressing. And they said, no, we can't. That's proprietary. 
I did say that right before. In other words, they belong to God. Can I say that? Gifts are God's property. They are not my gifts, and I will use them whenever I want to. That's not what it is. They are from God, and for they're the unity of the body. We can't possess the gifts. God uses them. The gift each uses will be confirmed by the body of Christ. Nobody can be rogue and kind of use a gift, and, you know, and, and especially if nobody ever agrees with it or somebody is disagreeing with it. It's got to be confirmed by one or two or two or three witnesses. George Wood said, there is no true on ongoing function of a gift unless it has the ratification of others in the body. So don't go rogue. Stay spiritual. And it, it really behooves us to grow in the spiritual aspect of the fruit. And we grow in the Lord so that we know that we're being used in. But how about this? Gifts not only work in the church, but George Wood says that in the book of Acts, when you look at the vast majority of the gifts that are used in Acts, they are outside of the church, in the marketplace. Did you know that any of the gifts can be used not just in the church, but in a small group atmosphere? They can be used at your home. They can be used when you're driving down the road and talking to somebody. They can be used at Food Lion when, somebody, when you get that Holy Spirit tapping on you and say, hey, somebody needs encouragement. It can be used at any time, not just in the church. The last thing that George Wood said, and I think this is really powerful, that gifts cannot be divorced from love. Gifts cannot be divorced from love. And this is the important thing. I, I did not see this before, but when I was studying this, do you know the gifts of the Spirit are seen in 1 Corinthians 12, and then it continues again in 1 Corinthians 14. But there's one chapter that doesn't seem to fit. Right in the middle. It's called chapter 13. And what is that typically about? Love. It's like God understood that there is no way that you're going to use the gifts without love. And so here's 1 Corinthians 12, 31, the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12. But eagerly desire this, the greatest gifts, and now I will show you the most excellent way. <laughs> you use the gifts, but I will show you a most excellent way. And he talks about love. And he ends with, uh, with actually the first part of 1 Corinthians 14. One says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. You can't disconnect them. We need to have a love of one another. We need to have the love of the world. We, of the world, not in the world. But we need to love people in the world. Right? If you're going to be used... Randy Hurst said this, he, he, he shows that as great as the spiritual gifts are, love is even greater. As wonderful as the gifts are, without love, the gifts become ineffective. The gifts are excellent, but love is more excellent. Love is not in competition with the gifts. Love is what makes the gifts effective. Amen? Amen. They become effective because we love one another. They become effective because we love people that don't know Jesus. All right, I'm sorry, the uh, booth there. I, I neglected to show the chart, so we're going to show the chart here and what we're going to be doing out of 1 Corinthians 12. So basically, there are nine gifts that were described in 1 Corinthians 12, and over the next three months, we will be talking about them. Not really, Ryan, pay attention. All right. When we look at the gifts, when we look at the gifts, what do we do? We see God at the top, and he is the one that gives us the gifts. And so when you see the line going down to the church, it just illustrates that this is truly gifts from God for us as the church. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to take one at a time, and we're going to kind of give a little bit of a synopsis of it. How many of you have been used in a spiritual gift at some point in your life? Anybody? How many don't know if you've been used in a spiritual gift, you know, that, but you probably have been? 
You guys are more spiritual than the nine o'clock. I've got to tell you that. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Because you have more hands being raised. So let's take a look at the first gift. The gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom. What this is, is it's speaking in utterance of wisdom spoken through the operation of the Holy Spirit. And it applies the revelation of God's word or the Holy Spirit's wisdom to a specific situation or problem. Out of all the gifts, I think that I, myself, am more proficient and have seen the gifts of wisdom and knowledge used in my office. And it is really kind of neat. How many of you have had it where you know the scripture, right? You know what's going on in the word. But when you're talking to somebody, there just is a supernatural manifestation of something you had never even thought of before. And a way that a certain scripture is used, you know, it's, it's like so cool when that happens. Sometimes I've looked at people and said, did you hear what I just said? Because it was profound, it was wisdom, it was wise. But because it comes from God, and there's a certain feeling about it that comes from Him. And you know that you know that you know. When you use, let me tell you something, when you're using a gift of the Spirit, you will know it's from God. And it edifies others. Now this is different than having the wisdom of God, which is available to every one of us for daily living. So when you study the Word... You are living, you are practicing wisdom of God for your daily living. This is attained by diligent study and meditation on God's ways and his word. Okay? But what we're talking about is that when you're administering to somebody and all of a sudden something just comes out of you that is so profound, it manifests itself. Probably from what you've already learned. You know what the, one of the greatest examples of that is Jesus when the, Israel, the Jews wanted to bring this woman caught in adultery. How many of you know that story? This woman's caught in adultery, and of course the, the law says that we must stone her. And so they bring, him, they bring her to him in order to trap him. And then Jesus kind of writes on the sand and the ground, and, and then he says these words, which I think cut to the heart. If any of you is without sin... Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. <laughs> wow. George Wood says this is a word of wisdom. This is Jesus using that because it, it went beyond what they could even understand. It nailed them in their hearts and they had to walk away. And that's the power of a word of wisdom. And when you're paying attention to the Holy Spirit, he can give it at any time. Amen. Spiritual wisdom that goes straight to the heart. Let's take a look at the second one, which is kind of really close to it, and it is the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is an utterance inspired by the Holy Spirit that reveals knowledge about people, circumstances, or biblical truth. And it's been said that it's often connected to prophecy, which we're going to talk about next week. Now, this is not book learning or scholarly knowledge, but an utterance of divine knowledge. And once again, I've been in my office before, and you've ever been talking to somebody, and all of a sudden, there's, there's, there's a word that just kind of comes to you, what that person has been dealing with. And it just is there. And so when I kind of investigate it, you know, you usually get things like, how did you know? Do you know God can reveal sin through no the word of knowledge? You know, you could tell with somebody, and the Holy Spirit, don't, don't ever be, you know, I don't want to be on the receiving end of that. But God can give you wisdom and knowledge. And it kind of covers both. See, the difference is, and, and the preacher's commentary says this, that wisdom is almost synonymous with to reveal truth. That wisdom which is nothing less than the knowledge of God himself. It's sort of a, a revelation of who God is in that particular moment. But knowledge has to do with a practical application of wisdom to human life and to all of life's situations. George Wood talks about this, um, the story of David, after he committed the sin with Bathsheba, and the prophet Nathan came to him. And the prophet Nathan knew what was going on, and he had a word for David. And it ended up helping him to repent. Jesus with Nathaniel in John chapter 1 
verse 43. It says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He said to him, follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethesda. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael asked, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Come and see, said Philip. Verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, he truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He knew something about Nathanael before he even arrived. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. It's like Jesus himself had a word of knowledge, and he knew who Nathanael was. Probably one other very powerful um, example of that is with Ananias and Sapphira. How many of you know Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5? In chapter 4, they were, they were selling the land, and they were going to give to the poor, and they were going to bring it all you know, to, to distribute to those that were in need. But Ananias and Sapphira decided they were to do something different. And it says this, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing to do before God? For himself. But he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, now Peter's using the gift of knowledge here. Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What makes you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Wow. And then Bill Torbert was called shortly after that because he died, right? And guess what happened to Sapphira? Same thing. But it was almost like, it was really fascinating. It was almost like God was giving Sapphira a chance, you know? But the conspiracy was there. The word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. The last one we're going to cover today is faith. The gift of faith. Now, this has been defined as a special supernatural faith imparted by the Holy Spirit that enables Christians to believe God for the extraordinary and miraculous. This enables a person to believe that an extra demonstration in the power of God now, this is not just faith. You know, I have faith in God, and, and so I follow him. This is sort of like you have difficult situations, and sometimes there needs to be a special move of that faith in your life to believe God for a miracle to happen. This is where God imparts something in a great trial in your life, because this is where sometimes it's manifested. When you're going through something and you don't have what you would believe to be faith, and sometimes God just kind of infuses you or brings someone else that can come alongside you and say, I'm going to believe for you. You may not be able to believe, but the gift of faith says, I am going to pray for you, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to help you in whatever faith that we can have. It's like God empowers us to believe for miracles. He empowers us to believe for the impossible because God is the, the God of the impossible. Some have the gift of faith that causes faith to arise in another believer. Or some have the gift of faith that can help a whole congregation or a group of people to accomplish something. George Wood said this about Faith. He says, a person with the gift of faith grasps the vision of what God wants to bring to pass and confidently lives and works to see it take place. It helps believers to continue in trial. I have somebody that I'm working with now, and she gave her testimony here on Sunday night years ago. 
And she has been through the ringer when you talk about her life. There's all sorts of abuse and family dysfunction and violence. And there was a terroristic relationship for three years. And she was injured in that. And today, she has an awful lot of back issues and physical issues as a result of what happened when she was 14, 15, and 16 years old. And the more that I talk with her, you know, we kind of looked at her faith. And I saw something in her that I, it, just, it just really kind of fascinates me. When most people in that context would turn from God and waver in their faith, this woman stood on the faith of God and is still believing for a miracle. Even though she can't see it, she is still believing. And, I, and I, I'll tell you what, I, it's, I struggle sometimes to even know where she's standing in that faith. What's it, what is it based on? She can't see anything. Folks, the gift of faith can come when you've got nothing else to believe in and the Holy Spirit comes to you and just gives you an awareness of who God is in your life and in your circumstance so that you are not defeated because the enemy wants to bring you down in discouragement. God wants to lift us up. And he gives us that faith. George Wood also says there's the faith that sees immediate results. Then there's the gift of faith that perseveres even when there is no immediate sign. It is easy to pray for a miracle and see it happen. But sometimes the gift of faith is there because I may not see immediate results. And I need to continue to persevere. The believer continues to faithfully trust that which God has spoken. He will bring it to pass. And I believe that in this story that I'm telling you today, I have the gift of faith for her. And it, and it keeps her intact to the miracle that we're still wanting to see in her life. Because we believe in what God is. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He wants to help us to grow. The example I think that was the most powerful with this particular uh, thing of faith is Abraham. Do you know how, how old Abraham was when Isaac came? Abraham was like 99 years old and she was like 100. Did anybody here ever give birth at that age? Now, that's probably maybe back then, probably they were 60 or so, but you know, it was a miracle. But in Romans 4, it describes Abraham's faith. I want you to listen to this and absorb it. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. <laughs> that, my friends, is a gift of faith. Against all hope, when he could not see anything, he believed still in God. And here's how it, how it goes. Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. God promised it. He stood on it. So shall your offspring be. And he did not give up. He did not look at the circumstances. And to me, that is an Old Testament gift of faith. Because you know what it says? It says here, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. His faith. Folks, what I'm hoping happens here is by the time we end next week and, and, and do the all nine, that you'll be able to see how you can be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, how many of you, since we've talked today, believe that you've been used at some point in the gift of the Spirit? You know what I'm saying? It is not something that you control. It's something God does. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. We're, next week, we're going to cover the last six gifts as we are really going to give glory and honor to God because he wants to edify us, transform us, and help us to grow. Let's pray today. Lord, we're just thankful. So overwhelmed by your presence and your Holy Spirit. We just thank you for what you are doing. 
in our lives. And, and this is a series about the Holy Spirit because it just demonstrates your love for us and how you want to edify the church and how you want to lift us up and how you want to perfect the body. And not only do we have the fruit that helps us to grow individually, but we have the gifts that can help edify the church and strengthen us. And we can see how wisdom and knowledge and faith can be used to strengthen believers and to strengthen the body because we want to be strong in these last days. So we are grateful for this time, Lord. Continue to minister to us through this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.